Hello and welcome to the Asian Game here on day eight of the FIFA Women's World Cup in Australia and New Zealand. Our coverage again sponsored by our good friends at SMC. Paul Williams here with you tonight down in Victoria Square again in the heart of Adelaide on what has been a disappointing night for Asian football. The Vietnam went down earlier 2-0 to uh, Portugal it was. Uh, that rules them out of the tournament. Two defeats in two games. Their campaign is over before they face the Netherlands in their third and final match. But the biggest surprise, the biggest shock, probably so far of the tournament overall, is the result that's just happened up in Brisbane. Australia losing to Nigeria 3-2. A shock result leaves the Matildas precariously placed going into their final match on Monday, I think it is, in Melbourne against Canada, the Olympic champions. Uh, we cross now to Alicia Canavas, who called the game for SEN tonight. Uh, Alicia, it's not the conversation I probably expected to be having with you. I thought this was going to be a pretty short, sharp conversation, talking about another Matilda's win that would have sealed probably their progression through to the round of 16. But that's not the case. We're here talking about uh, a Matilda's loss. Um, Australia went 1-0 up on the stroke of half time through Emily Egmond uh, everything looked to be going so smoothly at that point yeah it was and and the big thing that you would have noticed is the possession right we were in such control in that first half and we created so many opportunities Nigeria to be honest they came out the first 20 minutes and they almost looked a bit sloppy uh, like just a bit not cohesive not coherent and passes going astray like it really looked like some really backyard football stuff initially and I thought we we were very, very comfortable. The problem was, I think, in that first half, um, just weren't taking the chances, right? You get some golden opportunities. And at this level, at that level, playing tournament football, you really want to be capitalising on those opportunities when they do come. And so we weren't doing that. And as the match started to wear on, particularly in that in that first half, um, we're getting towards that 45th minute and it was still nil all. Um for the amount of opportunities and the quality in our in our stocks in terms of the Matildas, I would have expected us to be going into that half at two 0 up, and we just hadn't capitalised and and we weren't clinical enough in front of goal. It was a beautiful goal by Emily Van Agmon, great setup, great build up play, lovely finish. But um, obviously Nigeria we went asleep at the back. I think after that first goal, just for that, just got just got caught napping a fraction, and Carney was able to finish off at the back as well. So. Yeah, it, tale of two halves, Paul. Yeah, so if you, if you had to pinpoint it, where, where did it go wrong for Australia tonight? Or was it just simply that Nigeria was too good? We have to give credit to Nigeria, of course, in this as well. No one expected them to get the, the win. They were really good against Canada as well. They're now top of this group going into the, the final match day. Um, did Nigeria win this more than Australia lost this? Look, a bit of both. I... I my argument has always been, and it's probably been this uh, since the pools were drawn and, and the, basically all of the matches were, were laid out for all to see. This group was labelled the group of death by a lot of people. A lot of pundits said this was the group of death. And uh, I don't know if it's the group of death, but it definitely is a challenging group. And, and from that draw, I've said very early on, um, we play a lot of, against a lot of European nations in our build-up. We play against teams like the United States, a lot of Asian nations by, by way of our qualifications as well, sometimes some South American nations, but we very rarely play football against African teams, very rarely. It's just a fixture that we don't look to, draw upon. We've never gained experience in this space. And what African teams do very well, South Africa did it as well against Sweden, is they can absorb pressure. All right? That's the first thing they do is they're very happy to sit nine or ten players behind the ball for the first 20 minutes or so, look a bit off, off the pace. But that, what they do is they just absorb pressure. Absorbing pressure creates fr frustration. I thought Nigeria did that very well. That's the first thing. Um, while we had so many opportunities, and yes, we weren't clinical, Nigeria absorbed pressure at critical moments of the match. And so as that wears on over time, you start to question yourself a little bit, right? Like, how are we going to break things down? And so uh, mistakes start to happen. Long balls start don't connect with people as they ordinarily would. You start to look at other options and it just doesn't pay off. So in that way, I thought Nigeria did very well. Um, Australia, I don't think lost the game necessarily. I think 
just not being efficient in front of the goal in and around the 18-yard box. I thought there was a bit of wasteful uh, opportunities or, or moments rather in possession and, of course, around the, the mouth of the goal as well. And I think we'll look back at that. I think the stat for Australia was like 15 corners to three and 26 shots on goal, right? When you're not capitalising on that much um, offensive possession in critical areas, it, you, you're making it quite hard for yourself as well. Of course, we found out on the eve of the game that Mary Fowler and Ivy Lewick were going to be missing. Uh, more injuries picked up in training. I, I think there's a real question to be asked now of Tony Gustafsson and his selections coming into this World Cup. The decision to select Kaya Simon in the 23, even though she's clearly not fit, um, clearly not ready to play any kind of football yet. She's still not really doing anything in training doesn't look like she's going to you know take any really significant part in this tournament so to come in already effectively a player down an attacking player down then Sam Kerr goes down injured now Mary Fowler goes down injured and all of a sudden now attacking stocks are looking really really threadbare when perhaps if we hadn't have selected Kaya Simon and we've gone with another attacker we'd have that other option I mean we saw tonight he had to throw on Alana Kennedy up forward had to throw Claire Polkinghorne up forward um, or look like she's going to go up forward as well. So, I mean, we, we, we really have to call into to, to question the, the selections now of Tony Gustafsson, don't you think? Yeah, and I think they've been asked already by most of people, most people in and around the game sort of asked that question around Kaya's selection. I think in theory it's it's really good. Like I, I could make sense of it. Um, in reality, which is the reality we're in now, maybe not such a good choice, right? Um, take nothing away from Kaya brilliant player she's been a fantastic servant of our game uh for many years many major tournaments and she's been that impact fact, uh, player and that x factor for many many tournaments um but unfortunately like i guess the english team have had to do some of their key players due to injury and the turnaround time have to have had to be left at home right sometimes when you get to major tournaments you just can't afford that type of risk no matter, I guess, the sentiment or, or the history of a player sometimes. And that's that's football. And I think at the moment it is a bit of a pressure point as well for uh, the Matildas as well. And part of that pressure point is, is Sam Kerr's injury, right? I think if Sam Kerr was fit and performing, we wouldn't be asking these questions. So it's just changed how we're viewing um, the depth in attack. And I think we're rightly concerned. And just on those injuries uh, at training too, the ones we mentioned to, to Mary Fowler and Ivy Lewick, concussions in separate incidents at training. We heard that it was an intense 8v8 game, which apparently is the tradition. Um, you know, match day one, match day two before the game for the Matildas, that they do play a, a match at high intensity. But that's three players now that have gone down injured on the eve of a game at training. Um, again, there's got to be now questions asked of, of the training routine that Australia is going through. If it's... You know, going to be hurting Australia so much going into matches, um, there surely needs to be a review of what's actually taking place. Yeah, I mean, we can ask the questions and I guess it, it's difficult from the outside looking in and quite often we're not seeing everything, right? That that makes it a bit tricky. Um, I, I'm not so concerned about the intensity um, a couple of days out. I don't mind intensity. I think it's, it's valid. If you're a high performing team, you do need to maintain a, a, a level, particularly at training. It's very hard to, to run almost at 50%, 60% at training and then suddenly go into those high intensity matches back to back. So I don't mind the intensity. I think um, the concern is just uh, how does it happen? And, and if it's a monitoring thing of players, um, it, it could have just been a, an, an accident or an incident for sure. But how do we possibly um, monitor players a little bit better to not wrap them in cotton wool, but preserve them, I think is the key when you're in, when you're in tournament spaces and tournament um, football. So preservation is key. And at the moment, it's probably impacted us at the worst possible time. If I had to make a choice though, between impact at the worst possible time, I'd rather these injuries happen now with the hope that we get through this group stage than happen the week of a quarterfinal, right? That's a, a completely different ball game there as well. So it's a very difficult one. I don't envy people making the decisions on the inside because you're trying to do your job and prepare this team as best you can. But, um, look, it begs the question, I guess, how did two concussions happen in one day? 
And, and just finally, uh, to finish off on, if we look ahead now, uh, Canada on Monday, I think it is, down in Melbourne, you'll be there for that one. Um, the, the pressure's right on now. Australia has to win this game. Um, a draw, I haven't done the calculations, but I'm assuming a draw isn't enough to, uh, to get out of the group. So they're going to have to get a, a win in this game Given all the deficiencies that we've seen so far in this campaign, can you go into that match with any confidence that Australia is actually going to get the result that they need? Yeah, it's a funny thing. Like We can say that they've had two tough matches and they haven't necessarily been convincing the Matildas and either of them. I'd agree with that. Um, I'd also say in watching Canada, they too haven't been particularly convincing and I, I think they've had some disruptions to their squad. Jade Rose, for example, is a player that's missing from their, from their back line. Uh, Buchanan, I thought, uh, yesterday, last night, she was really exposed by Ireland as well. So she was under a lot of pressure. Um, so look, I, I don't think Canada are, are performing that well either. So the matchup on Monday, it, it's a do or die realistically for the Matildas. Um, it hinges as well now, I believe, on the result between Ireland and Nigeria because if Nigeria beat Ireland, it, it, it's a... It, win that's it it there's no opportunity for a draw or anything else in between it is a must win so the Matildas must go into it with that with that attitude um they've lost the two mat last two matches against Canada here in Australia if I'm not mistaken last year um that's probably a sore point and I think they'll be looking to turn the tables around um turn around what happened tonight as well get the belief back in the team belief back in in the nation in the country as well and come out and beat the Olympic champs on Monday. That is something I think they can do, um, and that will also be heavily hinged on the recovery of Ivy Lewick and, and Mary Fowler as well to add some depth. Well, thank you, Alicia. Uh, hopefully, we'll be again speaking on Monday after that game against Canada. You'll be at the game. You'll be at the stadium for that one. We'll be talking to you again after that. Hopefully, it's in better circumstances and we are talking about a win. But uh, thanks for joining us tonight. We move on now. As I said, uh, the game earlier today over in New Zealand saw Vietnam take on Portugal uh, needing a win to keep their World Cup hopes alive but uh, unfortunately came up short uh, a 2-0 loss at the hands of Portugal sees their campaign end. Uh, over in New Zealand uh, uh, Vietnamese journalist Chung uh, Nok was there uh, and he filed this report after full time on Vietnam's loss. First of all, I uh, I wasn't happy at all because after what we did against the America, we we hoped that everything would be you know would be better. But actually, it was a, a step back. And uh, and and today we we saw that we can saw very clearly that um, the approach was completely wrong. And uh, at the uh, press conference after the match, uh, uh, Coach Mai Chung also said that the, the player didn't obey the tactics. The tactic was that. We defend deep and then we try to counter attack. But um, in the first minute, in the first second, the the uh, the, the player they, they attack 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 and then they um, they left a lot of spaces behind the defensive line. So uh, the two goal in the in the first 22 minutes, you know, was very um, uh, was the thing that had to come. So um, this is you know uh, for me um, I'm sad. For me I'm sad because I. I, I have expected a lot from the game, and uh, before the match, I also um, talked to uh, Mr. Mai Jung and he said that he liked fishing. Well, uh, uh, a man who likes fishing must be, you know, uh, very patient. But today, uh, I didn't see the patience of of the player. So uh, it will be a very good lesson for the for the next match again uh, against the Netherlands. Uh, I don't I don't see it will be a um, uh, a win actually cannot we cannot win against the, the Netherlands but I, I hope to see the progress in the, uh, the mental approach and, and the uh, tactical approach of the players um, and uh, we hope that we have a good lesson today not for today not for the games against Netherlands but in the future they're yeah, very despondent there in Hamilton was uh, Tung, uh, not, uh, it's been a disappointing night for Asian football, as I said, we look ahead now to tomorrow night where China take on Haiti here in Adelaide. Again, they need to keep a need to get a win to keep their campaign alive after they suffered that uh, first up loss against Denmark over in 
Perth. Uh, we'll be at the stadium tomorrow night to bring you all the uh, reaction from that. Hopefully we're talking about a, a win for, for China in that one that keeps their hopes alive. But a little earlier today, to look ahead to that match, I spoke to uh, Chinese international Zhao Yuji. She was in the extended squad for this World Cup. Didn't quite make the cut, but uh, spoke to her earlier to get her thoughts on how, Ch uh, how, on how China's campaign is going so far. Well, Zhao Yuji, thanks very much for joining us here on The Asian Game. It's a pleasure to have you on the show with us today. I want to start by talking about uh, the Women's World Cup that's ongoing at the moment. We saw China, their opening game against Denmark. Unfortunately, that 1-0 loss they suffered late on in that game. A disappointing result, as I said, but interested to get your thoughts on what you thought of uh, China's performance generally in that game. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, inviting me to the show. Thank you, Paul. And uh, yeah, it's a little bit unfortunate that China lost the game, the first opening game. But like overall, I feel like even on the internet or like my friends, they are saying like China performed really well, either from attacking side or defending side. They play world class game against Denmark. And Denmark play the same, like they're more aggressive, they're fast, and they're more technique. However, China actually at the same level. But yeah, very unfortunate the last corner kick that, yeah. Well, I still think there's a uh, an argument, a small argument to be made that perhaps that goal from Denmark was offside. I think the player in front of the goalkeeper certainly was in an offside position. Whether she was interfering is a, uh, a matter of debate. Um, the next game now is against Haiti here in Adelaide tomorrow evening at Hindmarsh Stadium. Given that loss that they've had, they, they need to get all three points in that game now if they are to give themselves a chance to get through to the knockout stage, which they've never failed to do at a World Cup before. You know this team well, which we'll get onto in a moment. Are you confident that they can turn their fortunes around against Haiti? Uh, I I have a lot of confidence to this team, this Chinese team. But also, um, we need to show more respect to Haiti that everyone thought that maybe England going to beat them at least big score but then it's only one zero so we can like see oh maybe haiti is not that great they barely went to world cup this is like the second time or the first time after 90 40 uh, 47 or something but there's a still a strong and young vision team they have the top level attackers like they're aggressive they're fast so like i have confidence in china but also we need to be more aware and be more patient when we play against haiti because they show really great performance against england just talk to us if you can you're, you're back in china in shanghai at the moment um what are the general levels of interest and excitement there for for this tournament we see around the, the country here there's you know massive crowds everywhere certainly women's world cup fever has has gripped australia as, as one of the participating nations and china has a fantastic record in this tournament has achieved some fantastic fantastic results um what's the kind of level and interest level of interest and excitement that this is generating uh, back home in china at the moment right if you um i remember i saw the interview after the China against Denmark and one of the Denmark player was talking about how that stadium was full of like Chinese people cheering about the games. So it's, it's absolutely like even before the World Cup, it was a top new in China that everyone knew that after a month or after 10 days, there's a counting down day counting down like on the TV or social media about the Women's World Cup in Australia and New Zealand. It was it was amazing. And like if you turn the TV on right now, they're still playing the games a couple of days ago or this morning. Like it's always on. Like my family news about the World Cup, they were so exciting. Yeah, and the neighbors as well. Yeah, as I said before, you know this squad really well because you're a member of the extended squad for this uh, World Cup. Unfortunately, didn't quite make the cut. And no doubt there's some some 
um, lingering disappointment from that. But can you tell us about what the experience was like to be in camp with this team preparing for the World Cup? And how much motivation has that given you now as we look ahead to the next four-year World Cup cycle with an eye on 2027? Uh, you're still only young, still 24 years of age. How much motivation do you have now to make sure you get yourself in a position that you will be in that squad in four years' time? Oh, it's a great question. Yeah, even though I was not there, but like my spirit was still with the team. Like I'm still cheering for them in front of the TV. And like for me, yeah, 24, I, I don't know if it's still young or still have a long way to go. But like for a lot of players, I knew they're already in the squad, like they play starting in their national team. So I, I wish that, I mean, I, I'm hoping myself like one day going to play for China. But yeah, I have to work more harder. And while I was at the camp, like everyone was very ambitious in targeting the, the goal to be in the national team, to be in the squad, to be in the World Cup. Like I, I can feel everyone around me there. They're just super, super like passion about what they're doing and they inspire me just be around with them while I was training yeah it was a fun group to be around yeah it certainly does seem like a, a great team great spirit I've seen them a little bit here in Adelaide and there is that kind of great spirit and camaraderie in the team they all seem to enjoy each other's company um it that training camp that you had not your first experience of, of national team football you have played for the national team before at senior level and also at underage level as well can you tell us about those moments what they meant to you and also what it means to you to to be able to represent your country at international level right uh if we talk about like the under 20 world, world cup it was in france it was my first um world cup experience it was like 2018, right? Or 2019. I kind of forgot. 2019. It's U20. Yeah. It was like three, three years, three, four years ago. Yeah, I was, I was, I was young and I just went to college. That was my first year of college and it, it was a great, great time in France. Um, yeah, we play against Haiti, actually, in the first game of the group stage. And then we draw um, Nigeria, which they kick us out of the group. But I was proud. I was really proud to, like, finally, as a young player, young football player that I can represent my country to play the World Cup, which is my my dream, even though it's not like the senior team World Cup, but it's still a small step for myself in my life. Yeah, it was a good memory to recall for myself. Yeah, absolutely. Playing at a World Cup is a, a proud moment for any player, whether it's senior level or underage level, a World Cup is a World Cup and to be able to achieve that is uh, is certainly something to be proud of. I want to pick up on something you mentioned there. You mentioned you're in your first year of college because you did take a different career path to what we see from a lot of Chinese players. You did opt to go to America to go through the, the college system, the NCAA system there. Can you explain to us why you made that decision to go there and, and what you got out of it both personally and professionally as a footballer as well? Um, for myself, like uh, in China, there's a school system and there's another system for sport. So if you want to choose um, like a sport system, then for education part that you just barely reach that education, you have to fully focus on the sport to be, to be prepared for like, um, professional athlete so it's a little bit disadvantage for professional like after they retired because they receive less ed education they have less opportunities so in my opinion I think education is very important for a footballer so I 
like I was helped by my coach at that moment. Uh, she was my under 17 national team coach. And she was mentioned about uh, there is another way to play in NCAA and to be a professional, uh, to playing a high level of football, but also at the same time that you can receive great education. And I think that touched me, touched me really well. I think I, I would love to try this way. So yeah, I made that decision to eventually to went to US for that special, uh, like not special, but like different way compared with the rest of my teammates. I can imagine the uh, the college experience in Florida is a, a pretty good one. How did you enjoy that whole experience of going to college in the States? Um, it's super, it was super unique. I met so many people that I don't think I will ever met if I never been to that college. There's so many people who helped me through my past four years, like my head coach, Mark, my mentor, Kristen, and all the stuff around me. And they knew I'm Chinese, I'm new to the country, and they've always been welcoming. And they will explain to me over again and again if I don't understand one thing. And sometimes I actually understand, but they still worry about me like, oh, I, I know you don't understand. Let me explain to you again. They're just super helpful. And like, I, I, I'm really appreciate the past four years that I have done to be around and also my teammates. They're just very nice people. And quite successful you were when you were there as well. A couple of national championships as well. The college system in America is famed for its production of players. It, it breeds a lot of players for the US national team, for other national teams around the world as well. Given that and given your own experience, would you encourage more players from China to consider that as a, a career path to go over to the college system um, and, and use that as a different career path perhaps? This is a great question. Um, it's all depending on what they want. Like, yes, it's obviously a great way to go, but also you have to take fully commitment to go through the past four years. It was a tough four years to be a, and a student athlete to like study. And also you have to be on the top, top level on the field to play games. So it's, it's tough for me to do both things. And so if whoever want to go this school system, I would say they have to be fully commit to this path they choose. And then the support around them are also very important. You mentioned education before as being really important as one of the the reasons that you went to, to college in the States. So tell us, what was it that you did actually study in college there? Uh, so at the first, I was sport management. And then I, I was I was like, mm, I want to discover something different. So I choose the exercise physiology. And then I was shocked that the class was really difficult for me. Because at that point, my English was still not really well. And for the homework and the class, it was super tough. So I changed it again to so social science. Yeah, which is a very broad major. I can learn different things at once as well. You have made the move to Europe now, playing in Denmark at the moment. Um after you finished college in America, was the possibility of staying there and playing in the NWSL an option for you? Is that something that you considered or was playing in Europe and moving to Europe always a dream that you had that you had to take that opportunity? Um, at this moment, I think for Europe, um, it will be better if I'm in the national team squad that the European team maybe will be more considered me as a player uh, but this is playing europe is my is one of my another dream as well because i want to experience their football culture um playing us will be another way to go that i can be more athletic the speed the body fitness 
So I think both ways are really great. It just depending on the team and the coaches. If they consider me, yeah. And just finally, of course, you've got that move to Europe now. Um, as we look ahead to the next World Cup cycle over the next four years, what are the goals that you're setting yourselves over that next little period to, as I said, ensure that you are in a position to be selected for, uh, for that next World Cup in 2027? Well, first of all, I want to represent for my national team. I want to play the World Cup. I want to play for the Olympic Games. And secondly, if there is a chance, I want to play for um, Europe Championship. And yeah, it's a cool state for a footballer. And then third, I wish that less injuries for myself. Yeah, being healthy. Ujaiji, thanks very much for joining us here on the Asian Game. Been a pleasure to have you on the show. No doubt you would have loved to be here in Adelaide with me, but as you said, you'll be cheering the team on. You're here in spirit with the team, and uh, I've got no doubt you'll be watching and cheering on tomorrow night against Haiti, but uh, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much. Have fun in Australia. Yeah, great to speak to Zhao there. Unfortunately, as I said, it's a disappointing night for Asian football. The rain is coming down here in Adelaide. They seem to have got the memo about what kind of mood it is in Australia. Unfortunately, that is where we will have to leave things for today so I can go and find some shelter. Again, all our coverage here at the Asian Game, proudly sponsored by our good friends at SMC. We'll be back tomorrow with another episode of the Asian Game podcast here at the FIFA Women's World Cup. We'll be at Hindmarsh Stadium for that match between China and Haiti, but until then, it's bye for now.